And uh, today, I am kicking off our Christmas service, uh, our very first uh, service of our entire Christmas series. And Pastor CJ just closed out a fantastic, uh, it was like a two-month series where we were in the book of Revelation, uh, a series called That's My King. And uh, somehow I have to uh, transition from uh, Armageddon to Away in a Manger, No Crib for a Bed. So are you guys ready? We're going to go from Revelation to Christmas. And when I think about Christmas, I think about the very beginning. I think about, I'm like a Matthew one and two guy. I love the original story, the nativity scene. Uh, it's probably a lot of it is uh, honestly nostalgia. I grew up going to a, a series of like really uh, cheesy uh, Christmas live action, uh, you know, with Mary and Joseph holding the fake baby. Every now and then, you know, they like try a real baby and it would just scream the whole time and, and it was just not what they intended. But just there'd be some like live animals, the shepherd and the wise men. And I read uh, Matthew 1 and 2 and, and I, it's that same scene and I love it. The angel of the Lord uh, appears to Joseph and he says that Mary is with child and you are to name the baby Jesus and he will be called Emmanuel, God with us. And they're there with the precious baby Jesus and this uh, amazing scene that truly shook the world. It is the most uh, incredible, important thing that happened. The arrival of God incarnate, Emmanuel, came to be with us, to love on us. And I love that scene. But today I want to not start at the very beginning. I want to actually fast forward to Emmanuel at the end, to God with us towards the end of his life, because as powerful and, and dynamic as that beautiful Matthew 1 and 2 scene is, Jesus didn't have a lot to say in that moment, right? So I want to fast forward to Emmanuel, God with us, what Jesus said at the end. You know, as a pastor, I've been in ministry for 20 years, and I've had the privilege and the honor, but also the great sadness to come alongside many in their very final days of life. Maybe it's on hospice care in the hospital or at their home, but I've been able to come alongside people in those final hours. And there's nothing more profound and significant and meaningful than the last spoken words of someone who knows that their time is short and their days away from leaving this earth. And when they speak, you listen and you lean in because the person speaking knows that their words carry the weight of finality, that they know that this is it. I'm about to leave what I consider a gift and a blessing, whatever that may be, a last kind of will and, 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 and testament, not just of possessions, but of, of legacy. This is what I want to leave you with. This is what I want to say to my loved ones, possibly my children, maybe even my grandchildren. And it is within that scene that I want to kind of form uh, this message in that text, because that is where Jesus found himself at the end of John. And I'm not going to focus on his very final words. Those were public words. Those were words that Jesus spoke as he hung upon a cross. I want to talk about his final family meeting, his final words that he, have, that he had with his loved ones, with his disciples. And uh, the end of John, John 13, it's a, it's a power pack scene. I mean, there is so much that is taking place during this moment. And all within the same moment, there's a, there's a dinner. And I don't know if it was within an hour, might have been several hours, but so much happened in this last moment that I don't even think the disciples understood what was happening. It was in this moment during the meal that Jesus uh, taught them how to remember and honor him through breaking bread and taking communion together. This was also the same scene to where Jesus went one by one and uh, humbly knelt down and washed the feet of his followers, which, you know, they rejected at first. This is also the scene to where Jesus predicted that Judas would betray him and also that Peter would deny him three times. So just kind of picture what this is like, this Emmanuel, God with us, walking among man, and he knew that this is it, and he had one final thing to say. And he wasn't just saying it to them. He was saying it to each and every one of us. So today, I want us to focus on one passage in, in particular. This is where I want to kind of anchor this uh, Christmas message that at first is going to be like, is this a Christmas message? Because why are we talking about uh, Christ at the end? But I assure you, uh, it will absolutely make sense. And this is what he said to the disciples and what he says to us. John 13, 34 through 35, if you want to follow along. He says this, a new command I give you 
Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Love one another, love one another, love one another. If Jesus says something once, right? The red letters that we read in the Bible, it's important. Take note of it. If he repeats himself and says it twice, you need to, there's a reason for that. He's emphasizing something. He's like, this is in, important. Listen to what I have to say. The few times where he says something three times, it's paramount. It's foundational. Like you need to listen to this. And in this moment, he's telling his disciples, when you love one another, when you love one another, when you love another, everyone, the world will know that you are a follower of me. And you have to have some context of where they were at as they were hearing these words from Christ. They had just spent three years of following Jesus, right? And during this very brief but amazing moment of history, everyone during this era was experiencing the love of God through God himself. God incarnate, Emmanuel, God with us. They were actually being able to, to, to listen, to see, to feel, to experience the actual love of God being expressed through Christ. And this is all the disciples had known. And Jesus is turning to them and he said, now you love one another, love one another, love one another. And I'm imagining that what Jesus was trying to tell them that they didn't understand was my time is close. I'm about to go to the Father. I can no longer be with you, but I will send you my Holy Spirit, the comforter, to dwell with inside of you. But gentlemen, disciples, it's now on you. I'm handing you the keys to the early church. This is on you. People will now experience and see the love of God through you. So love one another. Now, why would he use that language of love one another? So think about it for a moment. You know, what is the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your mind, your body, your soul, your heart. Everything within you, love the Lord. And the second one is just like it. He put those kind of side by side. The second one is just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So why, didn't, why did he say three times, love one another, love one another? Why didn't he say, love one another, but also, most important commandment, love your neighbor, love the stranger, love the unbeliever? Well, I can just imagine, I don't know, I wasn't there, but I would imagine why he was saying this to them. So if you could imagine for a minute, what good does it do you? Or let me ask it a different way. You show love and kindness to a neighbor, who doesn't know the Lord. But then that same neighbor pays attention to you and they're watching you and they see you then, you were just kind and loving to them, but then they see you being unloving and unkind to another, uh, a tender of your church. They hear you gossip about someone else in the body of Christ. You're loving and kind to them and they want to receive that, but then they see your character and how rude that you can be to your spouse, or maybe cruel and harsh at times to your children, is that neighbor going to point to you and say, that's a follower of Jesus? There's something different about them. Is that going to be the first thing that they focus on? I believe that that is why Christ said, here's where you start, is to love one another. As I mentioned in the same uh, scene that's happening, Jesus bends down and, and, and just in this humble act of just servitude, servant leadership. It's so beautiful. He washes the feet of each and every one of the disciples. And I want you to see the common theme here. And I want you to, to hear this language that Jesus uses after he had just washed their feet. John 13, 12 through 15 says this. Jesus said, do you understand what I've done for you? He asked, you call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. But now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Wash one another's feet. You see this, uh, this same theme that's coming up over and over again, and and you guys might be like, okay, that's, that's easy enough, right? Let's serve one another. Guys, I'm your campus pastor, and I know you. It's not always love and warm and fuzzies among you guys, okay? I, it just, it's just a fact. We are people. We are broken. We are imperfect. And 
this is an area that we all need to grow in. The way we take care of each other, our families, the way we serve one another, the world is watching. And we all have room to improve, this guy included. Okay, I think some of the best messages I've heard is when you can sense that pastor's preaching to himself right now. There's some conviction there. And this is absolutely something that I want to be better at each and every day. So What I want to give you guys today is three ways that we can put into practice, three things that we can do every single day that I fully believe that if we put these things into place, we can fulfill this this commission that Jesus has put before us. Like, this is your mission. This is what I'm asking you to do. And we can't read the text and be like, that's great history. No, no, no. He was putting this into the hearts of the early church that passes from generation to generation to 2024 at Northview Church, he's talking to you guys. So here's three things for those of you who would like to take notes. Number one, if we want to live this stuff out, uh, I believe that we have to live a life of sacrifice. Now, that is not a word that we use often, sacrifice, right? That's not in our daily vocabulary. Show of hands really quick, uh, who has recently uh, sacrificed like a, like a calf or a goat. Actually, don't raise your hands. That would be such a, that'd be like one guy in the back. Yeah, I did it. So I, I'm using it as an example to say it's not common, all right? It would be strange if someone's like, I totally just sacrificed like four animals. It's like, what's wrong with you, man? That's not common language. And the reason it's not praise God is because Jesus made the sacrifice. So you might be wondering, like, we have to live a life of sacrifice. Didn't Jesus pay it all? All to him I owe, right? Sin had left a crimson saint. Did he not wash me white of snow? Why do I have to sacrifice? Didn't Jesus do it? Didn't he pay it all? And to that, I would say, praise God, he, yes, he absolutely did. But that same Jesus that sacrificed everything for you also said these words that I want to read to you. Luke 9, he said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. You know, uh, Pastor CJ has reminded us often that it's important that we don't read our Bible too fast, that we're not just burning through chapter after chapter, but actually slow down, focus on the language. What is God trying to say through this text? And beyond that, what's the context framed of what's happening before and what's happening after. So Jesus, take up your cross daily and follow me. It's so important to understand the weight of why he said that when you know he was responding to something. Immediately before that, he rebuked Peter. You, you might remember this, this, uh, this scene to where Jesus is letting his disciples know, hey, my time is getting short and you need to know what's coming. I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to be, you know, uh, abused, mocked, ridiculed, beaten. I'm going to go to a cross and I'm going to die. And Peter's response, if you remember, he said, Lord, it will not be so. I'm sure he might've said some other things like, I'll protect you. This is not going to happen. What was Jesus's response to Peter in that moment? Get behind me, Satan. Ouch. Can you imagine Jesus calling you say, get behind me, Satan. That is so heavy. Now, Peter understood sacrifice. He knew what sacrifice was, and I'll highlight why I I know that in just a, a moment, but he's a follower of Jesus. He understands sacrifice. But what Jesus was teaching Peter in that moment was like, Peter, if you don't pick up your cross daily, which means if you don't crucify your flesh daily, then you can do what you just did. You can give the enemy a foothold, that your emotions, that your flesh can stand in the way of what I'm trying to do and what I'm trying to say. So yes, Jesus paid it all. Once uh, a one-time sacrifice, a ransom for all. But here's the thing. We have security in heaven. We have the Holy Spirit living within us, but we also have something else. Unfortunately, we have this bag of bones that ages and falls apart a little bit more every single day. And within this bag of bones is our flesh that we are trapped in until we are in glory. And it is a war that is waged each and every day with the Holy Spirit within us of what God wants to say, what he wants to do in our lives, and what our own emotions and our flesh wants to react. And in this moment, 
Jesus is looking at Peter and he, I think he's just, I think he could have been like, dude, you're in the flesh right now. You need to, you need to, to crucify that because what I'm telling you is what needs to happen and you are absolutely missing it. And I think the lesson we can learn from Peter is that this is a daily process because maybe no one has actually sacrificed and given up more than Peter. Peter was one of the first disciples that ever was invited to follow Jesus. I believe it was him and Andrew. Jesus approached Peter and Andrew and he said, you too, you bozo, regular fisher guys, drop your nets and come follow me. No longer will you be fishing after fish. I will make you a fisher of men. And in that moment, Peter made a sacrifice we might not ever understand. He dropped his nets and he went to follow Jesus. But it doesn't highlight what he left behind and what he sacrificed. He sacrificed the stuff he just left. He sacrificed possibly his business. He probably left friends. He probably left family. So Peter is a a gentleman who understands sacrifice. Yet in this moment, he got hung up on the flesh. And one thing that we can be uh, reminded through this story is that we cannot rely upon yesterday's sacrifice for today. Every day we have to pick up our cross, acknowledge that we are in this bag of bones, a broken flesh. And if we don't learn to crucify that daily, we will not be in tune to what God wants to do and what he wants to say. The second thing that we can do is we can live a life of service to one another. Uh, James 2.26 says this, faith without works is dead. And, you know, I don't believe it's enough to have a belief system that has no action. That's, that's, what, that's what we're reading in James, right? You have to bend down and wash the dirty feet, right? That is, you have to put feet to your faith. It's not enough to just say, yeah, I, I know in my heart, that's good enough. I love my family and I love my neighbors. That's not good enough. You have to put some action into that thing so that others can feel that, so that others can uh, sense that you are actually care about them. They have to feel that, uh, to to feel your love. And I don't think that it's possible to achieve this unless we have a healthy foundation of love. Because if we don't, we are going to be exposed. The same example I brought up earlier of with our neighbor, right? We can show kindness and compassion. Anybody can flip that switch a couple times a year. I'm going to go to my local food bank. I'm going to stand outside a grocery store and ring a little bell. Like, there's so many things that we can do. It's like, hey, this is, this is good. I checked that box. I'm going to serve someone else. But if we don't have a foundation of actual godly love that is within us, it's just a matter of time before that we are exposed. And people are watching, and they're paying attention. Is this real? Is this a follower of Christ? So I want to highlight how I believe that we find a healthy foundation of love and not a foundation that's built with like sand and toothpicks. I think a healthy foundation of love, it starts with ourselves, right? We have to learn to love ourselves. No, this is not some like new age hippie thought, right? Just go with me here. We have to first and foremost, love ourselves. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've all messed up. We all have things from our past that we are embarrassed and ashamed of. And there is an enemy who is known as the accuser that wants to continually have your eyes focused on the rear of your mirror and not the big windshield in front of you. Hey, remember that mistake you made? You're probably going to do it again. You're not deserving of, of God's love. And he's going to continue to pour in lies. How do we expect to truly love those around us if love is not overflowing out of us? Love cannot overflow out of us if we don't have that love for ourselves. We need to pray, God, I'm asking you to show me how you view me because I believe that you sacrificed everything and you paid it all so that you could be Emmanuel, God with us. You are with me and you love me and I'm enough. And it has to start there. I accept that Christ loves me and I love myself. That's the base level foundation. The next layer of foundation is we must love those closest to us. Raise of hands, anybody married? Married in the room? Yeah. Is it always super easy to fully love and serve your spouse every single day, 365? It's like one person, write a book. I'll read it because I haven't figured that out. 
okay? It is a challenge, and this stuff takes work. It takes discipline. But this is a steady, strong foundation that will last for years that will allow people to point and say, that is a follower of Jesus. We have to love our family members and those who are close to us. The next layer is love one another. Serve one another. I'm going to be real. I'm probably not going to wash your feet, okay? Not interested. But I do love you, and I need to learn what you need. Not just think it, not just believe it, but do my best to serve you. And you need to serve one another. If we build this as a healthy foundation, that is when the world is going to say, I believe that. When you're kind to them, they're going to say, I believe that. That's a follower of Jesus. They have something different that I'm not used to. They truly love me. And I think, just think for a moment, do you know any, anyone who fits this description? Do you know, I'm sure we all do, at least one person that where you're just like, that person's undeniable. They have a healthy foundation of love. And when I'm around them, I can just sense the love of God and I can sense their genuine love for me. Uh, in my life, that's my father. My dad uh, gave his life to Christ when he was in high school. He was a teenager and um, he was the only one in his family who was a Christian. And he went through a lot of kind of mocking and poking fun and ridicule. People thought what he was doing, going to church three days a week was unnecessary and silly, but it didn't face him. He was someone, he loved himself. He accepted who God was in his life. And he knew that he was called and loved and chosen by God. And he determined no matter how my family treats me, I'm going to serve them. I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to share the gospel when it feels like the timing is right, and I'm going to serve them. And over the decades, people began to look to my dad, ask for prayer. He was able to lead uh, family members to Christ. And it was not because of his belief system, guys. It wasn't because what he said he believed as a Christian and the fact that he went to church. It was a lifestyle of putting feet to his faith and actually going to serve. His father was, my grandfather, was not a good man. He was the son of an immigrant, spent most of his life in poverty, alcoholism, drugs, addictions. It, he wasn't a good guy. But my dad was determined his whole life, I'm never going to give up on my dad. And no matter what he does or doesn't do for me, that doesn't change anything. I'm going to love him. I'm going to serve him. I'm going to pray for him. And he worked on my grandfather for years. And my grandfather wanted nothing to do with it, could not get him to step foot in church. But because of that consistent love overflowing out of my father towards the end of my grandfather's life, my dad had a phone conversation with him. And a couple hours later in that phone conversation, by the end of that phone conversation, my dad was leading my grandfather through a prayer to receive Jesus for the very first time. And I know that right now my grandfather is in heaven because of my dad's faithfulness. And my dad told me something after he passed that really stuck with me. And man, if we could just get this. He said, you know, son, your grandfather, my dad, was not a good guy. And he was not a very good dad. But I was determined when I was young and for the rest of my life that I was not going to give him what he deserved. I was going to give him what he needed. And church, if we could take that and begin to love others in a similar way, that we love them not because they deserve it, because guess what? That's easy, right? When someone loves you and they're kind to you, it's easy to be kind back, right? To reciprocate that and just be like, this person's great. I love them. No, no, no. What if we just determined that we are going to love one another and others outside of the family of God simply because they need it, not because they deserve it? And if that doesn't resonate with you, I want you to think about when God found you and you first received his love. Did you deserve it? Not a single one of us did. But did you need it? The final thing is we have to live a life of surrender. You know, I talked about this war raging between our, our flesh and our spirit, and it is a battle. And I, when I think about this war, when I think about surrender, I just had this mental I- image of soldiers surrendering. You know, uh, the Germans hunkered down on the beaches of Normandy, the Allied forces invading. 
and they pin the Germans in on the bunker, and they come out, and they surrender. What does that look like? I'm sure we can all visualize it, right? We've all seen Saving Private Ryan. Kids, don't watch that. But right, like you, we have this image of what this looks like. They're coming out. They're terrified. They're laying down their arms. Their, their, their palms are up in full surrender. They're waving the, light, the white flag to say, I am, I am now yours. My preference right now doesn't matter. My agenda in this moment doesn't matter. I am fully surrendering. And true surrender is permanent surrender, right? The Germans didn't go to surrender to the Allies, and then like an hour later, they're like, you know what? I changed my mind. Can I have my gun back? It doesn't work that way. It is permanent. If we can learn to live a life of every day, we look at our agenda and what, what is before us and just say, God, I feel like I've done my best. I, I have love. I feel like I'm, I've shut down my, my flesh so I can listen to you today. Here's my agenda, but I'm not holding on to my agenda. I have an open palm. Whatever you want to do, you can derail it. My life is yours. Whatever you want to do, I'm fully surrendered to you. You guys ready for that story I teased? This is the greatest story of surrender. And it happened through a good friend of mine. If you guys don't know who Pastor John Newton is, you should get to know him. He is our care pastor here at the Carmel campus. Uh, I've worked with him uh, for over seven years now. He's been in ministry uh, as long as I've been alive, which is like a super polite way of calling him old. Uh, But I love him. He's a good friend of mine. Um, But Pastor John is an incredibly busy guy, has a very busy schedule. He carries the majority of our pastoral care meetings uh, here at the campus. Uh, He's almost any given day, he's at a hospital visit, at a home visit. He is officiating a wedding, a funeral. Um, He handles all of our uh, benevolence. He is an incredibly busy guy. And one day, an email came uh, across his desk, but it wasn't even an email to him. It was a general email. Uh, Somebody who was online um, listened to one of our messages and was able to send like a general email to Northview, and somehow it landed upon John's desk. As I mentioned, John is busy. He had his agenda for the day. He could have easily just written a, a very polite letter back. But he began to read the letter, and someone said, hey, I watched the message today, and I have some questions. The way I was taught growing up is my path to heaven is to be a good person and to do good things. If I do good works and I do good things, that I will be in heaven. But I heard a message today that said that I only get to heaven through faith in Christ and is by grace and grace alone so that no man may boast. And I don't understand that. I've never heard this before. Well, John had a decision to make. He could have just thrown some scripture out at him and answered his question and say, hey, buddy, I'll be praying for you and sent a nice and helpful email. But John is a man who's been walking with the Lord a long time, who's fully devoted, who's filled with the love of Christ. And this is a man who is fully surrendered. And John and this gentleman begin to go back and forth and back and forth for weeks. It's been two months now. This gentleman, his name is Ram. He's a 27-year-old guy who lives in the Philippines, and he found our church at an internet cafe. I think we have a photo of him. He has to pay uh, just to keep the internet flowing here so he could find Northview Church. So he reaches out to John. And him and John start going back and forth, having these theological uh, conversations about understanding who Jesus is and understanding grace. And uh, John ends up sending him something. He goes, Rom, I think I I have something just for you. I'm going to send you a song. It's called Amazing Grace. And I just want you to listen to the words. Do you guys know who wrote, originally wrote the song Amazing Grace? John Newton. Not the guy who works here. He's not that old, but (laughs) sorry, John. But John Newton wrote Amazing Grace, and our pastor, John Newton, sends him Amazing Grace. And this is what Rom said after listening to it. This This is so awesome. This is him, literally, with the YouTube link open that John sent him, listening to Amazing Grace. Rom says this. He said, this song that you shared with me hits me so much. As I read the lyrics, uh, as I read the lyrics, I found myself in this song, even though I do not know the flow of the song or how to sing it. But reading the lyrics is having such an impact on my soul. The first and second verse uh, really touched me. Honestly, as I heard the song, something in there is touching my heart, that the message of the song is accurate of what I feel now. 
I believe the Lord is talking to me through this amazing song that made my skin hair standing. I love how he says that. I did not expect that God would find me in this month of October through your life, Pastor John. Thank you so much for sharing this song to me. It made me realize how God loves me with his grace. I'm reminded of my earthly father because we haven't seen each other for a very long time, but the heavenly father reminds me that he loves me so much. Thanks for the tears. It was later that night or maybe the following night Uh, Ram began to dive deep into the scripture that Pastor John had sent to him after, I'm sure, uh, amazing grace just echoing through his, reverberating through his mind. And as he began to read scripture, uh, Ram said at about three in the morning in the middle of the night, he invited Jesus into his heart to be his Lord and the Savior, and he fully surrendered, and he is now a follower of Christ who's received the grace of God. But the story doesn't end there. Ron then goes to his girlfriend, Emery, and he shares what Pastor John had shared with him because they had a similar background of how they get to heaven. This is the good looking couple right here. And he shares the gospel with Emery and she asks questions. And all of a sudden, now Ram, just like Pastor John, is answering all of her questions and, and leading her through the scripture. And at the end of it, he says, Emery, would you like to invite Jesus into your heart? And she says, yes, I'm ready. And just as John led Ram through a prayer of salvation. Ram is now leading Emery through a prayer to receive Jesus. And she, in that moment, gave her life to Christ. Praise God. Absolutely incredible. (laughs) Story doesn't end there. She has a dream that night. And in that dream, she sees all of these little children. And these little children are just running up to Jesus. And he is just loving on them. And he is embracing them. And she wakes up trying to understand why God gave her that dream. Well, check out this next picture. Emery is a child educator. And her and Ram felt that the Lord put on their heart that they should be now sharing the love of God with these children who she oversees. So Ram, I don't know how he found it. It was through a friend, found a really basic, simple Bible study and they got all the kids together. They didn't even have enough Bible study guides, and kids were beginning to, they had to share and kind of huddle around. We have a photo of this. You can just see these kids are hungry, but they're, they're huddled around, and they're all, you can see Ram there in the background. They're all gathered around trying to read. It was uh, the story of Genesis, the creation story, and I have to read this to, uh, to you. This was their reaction of what they were experiencing as they were sharing Christ with these children. It says, our hearts were touched to see the children learning the Bible for the very first time. God taught us and gave us the task to embrace his goodness and share the good news that we receive from him to others. What a wonderful God that we serve. And the fire in our hearts is to learn more about uh, God. Pastor John and to our beloved family in Christ, which Northview That's all of you guys. We are so thankful for all your prayers and encouragement that through your lives, we experience the love of God and put ourselves to work to share with others what we have now learned in Christ. Please don't forget to include us in your prayers always, that God continues to give us knowledge and wisdom on how to handle our first children's Bible teaching in the community that we sacrifice to teach. We have no idea how to handle this ministry. Brother, Welcome to the club. We have no idea how to handle this ministry. It's over our heads, but we are sincerely following what, uh, uh, what was the Lord leading us because we want to return the goodness of God and to fulfill his word. Church, is that not an incredible example in a story of how God's love is contagious? It's a burning wildfire if we will allow it to be. And finally, church, I know for sure Ram and Emery are watching right now, live on this live stream. And to Ram and Emery, I want you to know, we are so proud of you. And we are gonna continue to pray for you 
And we are so thrilled to hear the goodness of God and his love, how it overflowed out of Pastor John's heart to you, Rom, and how you allowed it to overflow out of your heart to Emery. And now it is overflowing out of both of you onto these kids and only heaven will know and we'll know one day the ripple effect that that will happen for possibly generations upon generations. So thank you for your obedience. Thank you for accepting the love of Christ and for not keeping it to yourself. And I want to let you know, uh, we are going to bless you guys. We are going to be sending children's Bibles to each and every one of the kids that you've been ministering to. We're going to be sending you some children's Bible studies. And our very own kids here at Northview are putting together a, a care package. And our kiddos are going to be writing some, some messages of love to, uh, to your kids over there because we are uh, one family, one body, one faith. You are a part of our Northview family, and we love you very much, and we're very proud of you guys. The love of God is contagious if we will let it be. And that's what I think Christ was trying to get through. Love one another, love one another, love one another. And man, God's grace. Remember Peter? He ended up denying him in shame three times. And when Jesus resurrected, he came back to Peter. And what did he say three times? Peter, do you love me? What did he say? Go feed my sheep. I will, Lord. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, go feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? He restored them three times. Then go feed my sheep. Go serve them. Go love them so they will know that you are my disciple. We're going to close with the song that I find incredibly relevant. It's called Reckless Love. And I want to give our hearts a moment just to respond to the message that you just heard. And I'm fully aware that uh, this message finds us all in different places. There might be some of you in the room who have never experienced the love of God. This might be the first time that you are hearing, is there really a creator? Is there really a God out there who genuinely loves me, who wants to be with me? Emmanuel, God with us, God with me. He loves me. He wants to be in a relationship with me absolutely he loves you. And what he's done for me, what he's done uh, for, for, for Rom, what he's done for these children, he wants to do for you. He loves you. And he wants to be in a relationship with you. And maybe during this song, if you feel led and are ready to receive that love, just invite him in. It is as simple as acknowledging, Jesus, I know you are who you say, said you are. I know that you love me. I want to love you. And I'm inviting you into my life. I'm inviting in, you into my heart so I can be in relationship with you, so you can be the Lord, the King, and Savior of my life. For, other, uh, for the rest of you guys, I don't know where you're at. Maybe you just need to be reminded that God really, really loves you. Maybe we can be humble enough to know we have some work to do to love each other well. And maybe those three things we could say, God, will you just search my heart during this moment? Is there anything that I'm doing that, that I'm not fully sacrificing? Am I living in the flesh? Is there an area to where I need to serve those around me better? And God, man, I haven't been living a surrendered life. I've been holding on way too tight. Teach me to live a life of full, complete surrender. Can we do that, church? I'm going to invite you to stand to your feet. Let's just let the Lord love on us for a few minutes as we worship.